as I travelled to Cardiff to read the Norway Plus Plan for UK's post-Brexit super university unveiled. UK's involvement in Horizon Europe is still undecided thanks to a deadlock. It's emerged that several leading universities are in advanced talks about relocation plans to an island somewhere between Norway and Newcastle. <laughs> Not yet known whether the handful of top universities involved in the deal would remain separate or merge to form a new UK super university, but it's understood that Theresa May has expressed an interest in becoming its first vice chancellor <laughs> after leaving Downing Street. Then I remembered it was the 1st of April. <laughs> so, um, but I want us to turn away from all this drama and focus on the longer term issues and the implications for UK higher education. A major failure of the referendum campaign and subsequent discussion, which can be attributed, I think, to all participants, has been the inability to understand the changing dynamic of Britain's geo geopolitical relationship to Europe and the world. By this, I mean the confluence of geography, economics, demography, history, and strategy on decision making, not just by those in and by parliament, but by other key actors, particularly higher, UK higher education. Despite the fact that nations invest heavily in their own education and science systems, education is, not, um, is no longer simply part of national systems. In fact, the biggest change over recent decades is the extent to which universities and colleges are no longer simply local institutions. Education research operates within a complex system of formal and informal linkages. Multilateralism lies at the heart of the European Union, of accreditation and quality assurance, of student and professional mobility, research partnerships, intellectual property, and so on. The UK has been and is a part and indeed an architect of this complex, multi-layered, multi-dimensional and multimodal architecture which underpins and supports global higher education. But it's remained largely oblivious to the significance of these developments. It has been, according to Geoffrey Sloan, an important but peripheral European state with a deep history that both binds and separates. Indeed, people here, as indeed slightly in Ireland, I come from the US, I find it particularly peculiar to talk about going to Europe as if it was some distant place. As Mike Shaddock says in the introduction to his book, and he, we've just heard this, um, him talk about it, and in chapter six, which I co-authored, he says the following in the introduction. Britain is a major contributor to the globalization of higher education but its inst institutions do not incorporate it into, into their governance and policy-making frameworks and treat their international activities as separable add-ons rather than an integral component of their mission. The reputation of British higher education remains high internationally, but its focus on globalization simply as a market for exploitation places it at risk as competitor higher education systems engage more closely with the detail of global regulation and coordination. Indeed, the EUA, the European University Association, has recently produced a, a brief on dealing with the UK in a no Brexit scenario. Geopolitics is not going away. So the aim of this session is to really try and to place this discussion of Brexit and the UK higher education within this wider context. And to help us navigate this are four keen observers of UK higher education. We have, um, just to stand up not quite in order, where we have Jamie Aerosmith, um, Aerosmith here, sorry, excuse me, Assistant Director for Policy for, for UUK International. Then we have um, Ludwig um, Hyman, previously of this parish, as one might say, in Ireland, um, and now working with QS. We then have David um, Palfreyman, um, Bursar and Fillet New College at Oxford, and finally Nick Hillman, um, Director of, of HEPI. We're going to start off as a panel, try and get some dynamic discussion between us. Um, 
and then open up to all of you. I w would like to encourage a wider discussion rather than grandstanding, and we can all go down rabbit holes of what is or isn't going on with the latest twists and turns, but hopefully we can stay focused on these wider um, sets of issues. So um, thank you very much. We'll turn now to the panel. And the first question really I expect to, for us to try and focus on is to what extent does Brexit augur um, changes in the way UK higher education sees itself and interacts internationally with others and vice versa? Do you want to start, Jamie? Absolutely. Um, thank you, and thank you for um, inviting us to join this uh, panel today. Uh, I'm certainly very timely. Um, I think uh, I'm really interested, actually, by the comment you made about international being seen as uh, an, an add-on and not part of the mission of, of, of universities. Because um, I certainly think, uh, sort of from my perspective and, uh, and from the engagement we have, that, that is certainly something that, that has changed really substantially in recent years. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we certainly um, see that universities, that higher education and research are, are fundamentally uh, outward-facing international activities. Um, and I, I, don't, I think that predates Brexit. Um, and universities, I think, are, are, will always be international in their outlook. I think, um, however, the way in which we engage, with, particularly with our partners um, uh, in Europe, is, is going to have to change and is going to change quite substantially. We, had, uh, we hosted our own uh, event last week, uh, an international higher education forum, had speakers from about 15, 20 different countries. Um, and uh, it was described by uh, my own director as a, as a big European group hug. Uh, everyone uh, being very positive about you know, wanting to work with the UK and the drivers for wanting to work for the UK still being there. Um, the excellence, the reputation we have, the, the, the capacity and the experience. However, those really strong words and, and positive words can only be sustained for so long. Um, and without clarity and without certainty of how those relationships can exist in the future and can be funded and supported, um, then that actually will lead to some changes, I think, in how those relationships uh, operate. And I expect one of the issues is the way in which different partners, are are, uh, your other European partners, are finding other partners. And their relationship in the world is changing as well. Certainly, from an Irish perspective, we are looking whether it's higher education or we are looking at other sectors, we are looking beyond the UK as a partner, as a business partner and so on. That's clear. So what about, Ludwig, how you might think, I mean, how does the UK see itself or others seeing it? You're looking at both from the inside and now from the outside. Well, I guess um, what's surprising about um, the way the UK is dealing with these, um, um, with this, uh, negotiations is that you don't get a feeling that what other people on the other side beyond outside of the UK are, are thinking or feeling or how they're um, uh, strategizing um, and I think that's a shame because uh, even in the whole negotiations around no deal it was all very focused on what um, UK politicians thought and it wasn't really looking beyond that but in terms of higher education I think um, I think it's important, and in terms of international rankings, um, you know, indicators that are really important are um, the number of international students, international staff. Um, there's a new indicator being rolled out, which is called uh, the IRN, so the International Research um, Network Indicator, which looks at um, how many different universities um, or countries um, a researcher wor works with, um, and the number of countries is important. So suddenly, if you lose 27 countries with, um, uh, overnight, or if you make research much more difficult with those countries, um, this will affect rankings like hugely. Um, and that's something that's not really been understood because you read a lot of statements by ministers at the moment, and they're always you know, celebrating how well the top UK universities are doing. Um, and that's, I mean, it's natural at this stage because the UK is still in the EU, so it's benefiting from the EU research funding, it's benefiting from our freedom of movement. Um, what will be really crucial is to look at what happens post-exit, and even then, there'll be a lag because um, this will take several years to like um, come out because in terms of rankings, we look at citations over the previous five years, research funding um, awarded in the last five years, things like that. So. 
it won't be immediately visible. So what's important is to plan now um, and take that into account instead of just saying, oh look, this year we did amazing, so actually it doesn't mean anything um, because that's really short-sighted and you have to plan ahead. So, uh, so David, my, how might you see the changing relationship or what kinds of changes in the way UK um, higher education works globally or, and how it is perceived? I think going back to Mike's point about the huge diversity within the sector, I mean, I see the, the top of the pyramid. In most countries, I think there is a pyramid of prestige. In some countries, it's muted, it's masked, it's not talked about, but it exists. And the institutions at the top of the pyramid, whatever they are, 30, 40 worldwide exchange staff, students, people's careers move around across those institutions. I don't think any of that's affected by Brexit, if it ever happens. Uh, and whatever may be the leftover effects of the attempt to Brexit in terms of the negative vibes given out uh, to people coming to this country, uh, I think that, that, that will go on, that global movement within the elites, which I think dictates that most of those elites have very similar HR policies to academic recruitment and retention. They have to operate in a very similar way because they're trying to recruit people who can walk very quickly to somewhere else. And then you've got the rest of the university system below the peak in each pyramid uh, and how they function and what that means here in the UK if Brexit happens. Uh, potentially, clearly, it's bad news uh, for those universities down the pyramid who have replaced the missing 18-year-olds because the Brits forgot to make enough babies 18 years ago. The demographic decline, the temptation then is to fill up with EU students. That may become, well, that will become definitely more difficult if they're not going to get the student loan payment of tuition fees and so on. Uh, and then the international student recruitment, and that comes back to whether the bad vibes have given, been given out, that in fact I'd better think about Australia or Canada or New Zealand or even one of the European universities that's increasingly teaching English and looking to grab a share of the global market. As has been said just now, that will take several years to play out as to whether there is a negative effect. Uh, but fundamentally, you know, there's a huge, huge reliance uh, in some universities on overseas fee income. It's needed to balance the books. And of course, as you may have seen from the nerds who produce the financial sustainability data, the finance officers and so on, hidden away in a room, uh, crunching all these numbers, the massive transfer of subsidy from the profit on overseas fees to prop up the huge loss on every research grant that you guys get and the physicists get and the engineers get. Research is run at a huge loss. You need a mega supply of overseas students to compensate in terms of keeping the institution solvent. So there's very interesting questions there, I think. Uh, for the future of the solvency of institutions. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you uh, to Simon and others at the uh, Centre for Global Higher Education Studies for inviting me to be here. Um, we're very bad at, in higher education at coming up with good acronyms, aren't we? I mean, CGHES is a fantastic institution, but almost. Um, Kugus, is that how we say it? I'm not sure. Um, but it's great to be on this panel. And I think the starting point has to be, we are living in the most extraordinary times. I mean, there was a bunch of emails floating around the panel before today where one of them said we shouldn't uh, discuss the political manoeuvring. But I think given um, the last 24 hours and the 24 hours before that and the 24 hours before that, that, that might be impossible. Um, and I mean, I'm really a historian by background and I don't think you can find any other five-year period in the history of... British higher education, where there's been so much change in such a small amount of time. You know, in the last five years alone, we've had five ministers for universities, four secretaries of state for education, three different types of government. We've had two general elections, and of course, we've had um, the referendum. Um, and I wondered if, uh, if it's not too rude, if I could just ask, ha, 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 what, because it's always useful to know who your audience is at these events, and what proportion <laughs> of the audience. Can you put your hand up if you are on the UK electoral roll? So you're someone who has a voice in this debate. 
And it, can you put your hand up if you're not, if you're an observer, if you're one of those people who can laugh at, laugh at all the <laughs> horrors going on? Okay, so so majority of people are. Someone said to me, um, actually it was, it was before the original referendum, it was a former Conservative MP, a very pro-European former Conservative MP who could see which way the country was going and said, we will lose this referendum. He was on the Remain uh, side. He said, we will lose this referendum unless we can get people in Brussels and in, uh, elsewhere in the European uh, uh, Union to say they don't want the Brits to stay. And the only thing that will force you know, a, a majority of British people to vote to stay in the EU is to be told, we don't want you and please will you leave. And, and I continue to think that's probably true and the trick was missed and we might, I mean I personally think the universities um, fought the referendum in completely the uh, wrong way. But my, there's a final thing I'll say because I know there's lots of people in the audience who want to come in but my, uh, I, I'm not as down uh, about the future as many people are but I am worried about what um, Janan Ganesh who's a Financial Times journalist called uh, the aggregation of marginal losses. I'm worried about you know a tweak here, a loss of funding there, a change to the rules here and gradually over a period of time it adds up to an impoverished sector. And I don't just mean impoverished financially. I mean, I was at the Royal Northern College of Music the other day talking to their principal. And this is a tiny, tiny anecdote, but I think a powerful one nonetheless. She said, you know, our job is to put orchestras together, partly. You know, we train musicians of all sorts of instruments and the end result should be a fully fledged, fantastic world-class orchestra. And she said, you know, nobody in the UK really learns the bassoon anymore to a decent level. If you want a good bassoonist, you have to go to Italy. All their good bassoonists go to Italy. Therefore, if you want a good orchestra, it is truly uh, least European, if not truly global and international. And she was very worried about where their bassoonists were going to come from in the future. That's a tiny, tiny example. But if it's replicated across the sector, in all sorts of ways, then um, uh, you know the challenge uh, will be immense. Yeah. Um, thank you all. I mean, coming back on, on those questions of whether or not Nick's point about having fought the referendum in the wrong way, does that reflect this view that certainly Mike mentioned earlier and I mentioned as well with regard to the fact that despite the fact internationalization and universities may see themselves as international, it's not, it's a passive approach to it. There's an assumption about it. Um, it's not one in which the, the global is, is deeply embedded in the way in which universities see themselves, which goes back, I could see some of that also, likewise in the US where, where I come from. And if you look across Europe, there is, um, across the EU, um, there are discussions that are going on in which I see fewer UK people at. So just being back and, back and forth, or the changes that are happening, and as I said, uh, people moving on, forming other relationships because out of necessity, um, certainly from an Irish case, it's out of necessity having to form other kinds of relationships and the same has happened with the Swiss as well and they have found themselves in that. So have you experienced the effects already on the way in which UK, you inter interacting with um, international partners or other EU partners? I mean, turning to the Commonwealth is not quite the same thing in the same way. Um, if I may start, um, I think from an, an organisation as, as Universities UK International, I think sort of bizarrely post-Brexit, uh, there's been more engagement and, and, and uh, uh, more consistent engagement across the whole of Europe uh, than, than ever before. And I think universities are, are starting to do that. I think a lot of that was previously gone, went through Brussels. Uh, and I think there's uh, a, a much greater focus on the bilateral uh, relationships, but out of necessity. Um, and uh, as, as you say, though, I think uh, you, I, whatever happens, that Europe is always, we are always going to be part of, of Europe and part of a European higher education and research environment and system. Um, and collectively, Europe will, is, is by far and away the biggest collaborator that the UK has. So um, we need to find ways of being involved in those conversations. And I think it's, it, yeah, it's more important than ever that we are actually at the table as far as possible and trying to, to make that case because yeah, working with the UK, it's, it's not maybe the, uh, uh, the, the presumption of working with the UK, which has maybe been there for a lot of universities, a lot of researchers in the past, might not be there in the future. So I think we, yeah, we have to work a lot harder. Mm. Anyone else? Have? No, I just thought. 
Yes, and that's something I think that UK universities have always like done. Um, they have engaged with European partners, but perhaps not to the extent uh, and not in such a strategic way as they have been doing with other parts of the world. So perhaps like the well, Brexit has, you know, given a new impetus to um, engage with Europe uh, more properly and with um, with a more delineated framework and you see these bilateral agreements popping up between, I mean there was one between Trinity College Dublin and the University of Birmingham, uh, Imperial College London and TU Munich and I mean that's something the government obviously would encourage and um, if you read the previous technol technical guidance notices that the UK government has well issues quite regularly at the moment, um, it says you know UK organizations may wish to consider bilateral arrange arrangements with partner organizations that would enable them to continue their projects, that's good, but um, it's really basically an abdication of responsibility where it's the government is saying, listen, we may not get this fixed in time, so uh, we actively encourage you to sort this out yourselves. Um, so that's, that's a shame because I think universities would hugely benefit from um, the government providing a framework or at least um, promising uh, funds to support such partnerships because obviously this costs money universities have to tr strategize they need to like think who do we want to work with uh, and several of these universities that i just mentioned have put you know large sums of money towards those partnerships and that's um, a huge financial strain yeah. um, could just, I, just to come back on on one point there i think uh, uh, yes we have seen uh, the, the sort of more formal relationships uh, between UK institutions and European ones, but I, I don't think any of those partnerships and relationships are, are only starting now as a response to Brexit. I think it's, we're seeing the, the formalisation of partnerships that, that existed previously for the, the reasons that you've set out, but I don't think it's the case that these are just being set up now as a, just as a response to, to Brexit. I think it's, it's very, very difficult to set up. I think most people in here probably know better than me to set up um, institution-to-institution -institution relationships. They usually have quite a lot of history, quite a lot of background to them as well. So. Uh, yes, we're seeing some formalisation there, but actually the, you know, the, the engagement of universities sort of across Europe, just look at the, the number of leading coordinations that the UK has at, uh, uh, on Horizon 2020, um, that engagement has been there. Um, I think we've just seen different ways in which it's managed now. And that will change the future. Da David, can I ask you on the, your point about the differentiated um, responses or, or the way in which uh, differential effects of... Um, of Brexit, in which you mentioned that. I mean, how do you see different futures for different institutions, their ability to, to be more competitive, and certainly there are the survival issues you mentioned in terms of demographics. So we see quite a lot of these high-level MOUs being formalized between elite institutions, if I could say, certainly I've, I've seen a, quite a lot of them from Russell Group, but where does that leave the rest of them and the regions in which they're located? I'm a, I'm a boring nuts and bolts bureaucrat, so I watch all these things being signed by the great and the good and the pledges of doing this and that. And then I think, well, actually, the reality is what happens when you come to advertise jobs and are you advertising them at such a rate of pay that you can comply with the, the employment visa stuff? Um, and, you know, if you're somewhere like Oxford, if, if it's fishing in an international market, then it has to pay the right rate to postdocs or whatever else that ensure people can get the visa, uh, as opposed to perhaps hoping that you can get them cheap from the EU because it's not the same threshold figure or it doesn't apply in the way that it does for an international employment visa. So there's all sorts of issues like that when you, you have to get down to the nuts and bolts. And I think probably I'm, I am skeptical of the, the grandizing sort of we'll link with X, we'll link with Y, because I think what matters in the end is the Department of Engineering at X uh, wanting to work with colleagues at Institution Y uh, and swapping staff and it, it's collaborative research projects and it's done from the bottom up, I think, rather than the top down, uh, and especially if the top down forgets to sort of really sort out the nuts and bolts about pay scales and the employability of people and so on. So what are the spill, likely spillover effects? So if we're looking at if higher education is effectively an anchor institution and we have these issues that are quite differentiated across the system, how does that play out across the UK and different regions in the UK? 
Well, it could be deferential depending on you know, the ability of an institution to pay the going rate. What I would hope is that it involves paying better rates to low uh, first grade academic staff that actually instead of the management assuming you can get these folk on the cheap somewhere or other, that you have to start paying a competitive international rate. If you do that, then it means your research is run at even more of a loss and the ability of that institution to prop up and subsidize its research depends on its mix of other income generating and profit making activities. So it really does put a pressure on pretty clever management to make sure that if you really are in the international research game, recruiting competitively and so on, uh, that you know how you're going to cover the loss you make on all your research activity. Uh, thank you. I, I, as the bursar of a great Oxford college, um, you must be wondering if your staff are listening to that about to get a, a pay rise uh, <laughs> letter or two in. I would if I was uh, uh, one of your staff members. Um, <laughs> I mean, I spent uh, a long time, uh, a dozen years actually, working for David Willett before I took over uh, at Happy. And uh, for the last three and a bit years of that, he was the Minister for Universities and Science. So he spent a lot of his time on the road, traveling around the world, signing these MOUs and all that sort of stuff. And I agree with David that it works best when it's from the bottom up, but sometimes it helps when it's from the top down. And, and I think, um, to be honest, I think even a lot of people on the Brexit side of the EU debate get that. They, they wanted uh, an internationalist, um, open uh, Britain. Not, not all of them, but some of them wanted an internationalist, open EU. But I, but I think what I worry about is the British tendency to be a bit patronising when what other people want is partnership. So we think it's the right state of affairs that ten times as many students from other countries come and study in the UK as we send out to study in other countries. But when ministers go to India, you know, the Indians want a partnership. You know, they want true partnership in research. They want British uh, 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 students present in India too. Um, and, you know, the idea of Jacob rees mock being our sort of um, public face for um, a new open internationalist Britain is one that um, uh, uh, probably lots of people would have uh, uh, rude words for. Um, <laughs> So, so I think, you know, the, uh, yeah, so what I would say is it's got to be about partnership. It's got to be about what give and take and not maybe the way that some of these relationships have worked in the dim and distant past. So how does that change the relationship of the UK to its partners? So there's a lot of activity going on about forming up and funding for relationships, research relationships with the Commonwealth, regenerating those links and so on. But I think Simon's point earlier was, was quite an interesting one of going beyond that. So really not relying on these just traditional, trying to rebuild that in some kind of way. But so what, how does the, the UK and UKAG see its role in this, new in this new future? Because whatever happens, whatever kind of solution comes out, it certainly seems from, from my perspective that whatever happens, it's not putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's something different. And that, so what is that? And where does UKAG fit within this new different? Um, I'll start again. Um, actually, this is a, a something I heard uh, Baroness Valerie, Valerie Amos um, uh, uh, from, at uh, SOAS. Um, speak about last week and, and really talked about the need um, to, to get beyond what I think she describes the, the relatively empty rhetoric of global Britain, um, which is generally a kind of euphemism for, you know, we want your money. Um, and, and particularly when working um, uh, sort of beyond traditional partners within the EU, absolutely looking towards the Commonwealth, but also the global south more, more broadly actually having a far more um, sort of, uh, a far more developed understanding of actually what, what do they want from the partnership and what do they need from the partnerships um, uh, and expect and and higher education can have a really uh, important role to play in that as well but but absolutely having to, to move behind what um, I think may have historically been um, sort of more transactional relationships really looking at how how we as a community we as a sector uh, and as a country can actually support their own goals as well um, so looking at, for example, maybe around the sustainable development goals and looking at the, those kind of areas. So that might be one opportunity for kind of shifting the focus of those relationships a little. 
I'll just add something very briefly. And yes, as Jamie said, um, it's, you know, if, if you want to engage with new regions in the world, it's not necessarily about, you know, what's your return on investment going to be. It's about, you know, s the money is going to be like spent and you're not necessarily get a, getting a surplus out of it. And I think that's something that's difficult at the moment to acknowledge uh, from the side of the UK because um, the, the, it, it, what's with the potential loss of EU research funding, there won't be that much money to go out and like find completely new partners and uh, you know fund research projects that don't necessarily end up um, translating into um, commercial um, applied knowledge. Applied knowledge. So. Yeah, and, and I think also there's a huge danger that I'm not sure that management in most universities is competent and capable of really doing the investment appraisal and assessing the market opportunities and so on, unless it's going to take it that it's a massively subsidized operation. You've got plenty of examples of English universities that have tried opening campuses abroad and all the rest of it and are now nursing, thumping losses and looking at ways to extricate themselves without too much embarrassment. So I think it does put an onus on, unless you're, you're really deciding as an institution, you've got this pot of gold that you can spend subsidizing over five, seven, 10 years, the development of a fuzzy kind of relationship that might have this effect, might have that effect. It's quite difficult to sell that to your finance committee, to your council members, uh, unless you've got in the, in the privileged position of having that spare money, then you're looking for stuff uh, that has a pretty quick payback and also you're looking for stuff, you've got to be very careful in trying to you know, do your projections and work out that you really, that it's not going to be five years, it actually will pay its way within three years, etc. Because most of the examples that have happened have not been happy experiences uh, for those institutions and their management teams. Uh, and then in the end, it's the poor old academics who suffer because you make redundancies to cover the losses you've made on your grand schemes that haven't worked out. I'll answer it, if I may, in a negative way, which is I'll say what I don't think it is is the new UK government's educational export strategy because that has um, a lower target for growth than previously. It has the tiniest tweaks to visas, you know, they're so small, they're barely noticeable. It leaves students in the uh, international net mi inward migration target that the government has. If it's, I know you UK have been more positive about that strategy than I've been. If it's a staging post on the way to a bigger, better future, fantastic. But if that is the be all and end all, it's, it's frankly not uh, enough. Um, you know, it, I know it's partly driven by number 10 priorities and most uh, potential alternative occupants of number 10, um, including um, very strong Brexit. You know, when Boris Johnson was mayor of London, he, he understood the importance of international education to this great city. So it may all change, but we need to keep the pressure on. I think, but incidentally, I think if some of those other people do become occupants of number 10, we'll have other worries. You know, I was thinking of what Michael Gove's attitude towards university autonomy would be likely to be when Mike Shattuck was talking this morning. You know, if you think it's bad now, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you know, there was a reason why Michael Gove wanted universities in the education department when he was the Secretary of State for Education, but I say that as an, as an aside. But I, as I say, I think we mustn't forget the government has just published the first uh, international education strategy for six years, and it's good but nothing like good enough. Nick, yeah, I'd like to say, yeah, we should put uh, more pressure on the government. And I'd like to challenge um, the idea that we are putting enough pressure because um, I was reading that international education strategy and, and the minister was saying, you know, in terms of research funding and um, negotiating association with um, association to Horizon Europe, uh, where are we exactly? And um, it said that, as stated in the white paper, which was published last summer, on the future relationship between the UK and the EU, we are open to exploring participation in the successor scheme to the current Erasmus Plus program. And, um, and this is the same um, position um, for Horizon Europe. So we're still at the stage where you know, the negotiations apparently haven't even taken place. Yeah. Um, and that's inexplicable three years, nearly three years after the referendum. It, it just shows that there's like a 
a complete like break in policy. Um, there's no information filtering. And then when you um, look at the European Commission's proposal for Horizon Europe, you sort of understand why the UK's position is so you know, non-committal. Um, in Article 12, it says, I'm going to read it out because I haven't learned this by heart, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the conditions determining the level of financial contribution shall ensure an automatic correction of any significant imbalance compared to the amount that entities established in the associated country receive through participation in the program. So, you know, that basically is wiping out um, the billion, multi-billion um, money UK universities were making or receiving through the program because UK universities are excellent. They're um, receiving a lot of this money um, and, you know, they're getting more than they put in and that's about to be lost through this article. And I think that's why we haven't seen um, any progress in the position of the UK government on this. That's, yeah. uh, that, that's going to change in the future. So can I open this up now to discussion um, from the floor, comments, if you could keep them short, basically Q&A. Um, I'll take uh, several different questions to the panel and then, and then come back. So we'll take a group, if you could just introduce yourself, try and keep them short. Okay, we'll come back. Sorry. Bloomsbury Institute. Um, just to be picking up on your discussion around the Commonwealth, I mean, I think it's interesting, Nick, in the, in the government strategy, the word Commonwealth appears nowhere apart from FCO, Foreign Commonwealth Office. Um, at a time when the UK is chair of the Commonwealth. But I think it is important to anchor our uh, thinking in the Commonwealth. As I think, Jamie, you're right to talk about the SDGs, but also in terms of how our British university is going to tap into fast-growing markets where we can build relationships more quickly. Um, Baroness Fairhead, 24 hours ago, addressing a business audit, and said the case for the Commonwealth is a 20% reduced cost of doing business with those countries. Yeah? And that's the argument that is important as well. So my question is around, don't we need to reframe this, this thinking around the Commonwealth? It's not just around, um, I mean, it is about the SDGs, it's very important. It is also about accessing fast-growing markets more quickly. It's also about, and this is also often not forgotten, if you look about black, Asian, ethnic minority students in the UK, there is an absolute appetite for connecting into some of those countries of origin, certainly in South Asia and, uh, and Africa. And so I think we need to reframe that. I just wonder whether that's part of what we need to do um, in, in, the, um, in, 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 in the context, and also in terms of science and technology. You know, the fastest growing opportunities in science and innovation will be in fast growing markets in the Commonwealth. So it provides an opportunity to do that, don't you think so? Um, Fiona Ross from Kingston University. I'm going to continue with the reframing um, theme, but from a slightly different stance. And I, I think um, looking back at the last three years and, and now forward, I think um, universities have lost um, missed a trick around um, talking about the whole Brexit debate in terms of markets and um, income and the losses that they stand to gain or think they're going to going to um, have as a result of Brexit. I think what, we, what, what is missing in this whole debate is the, the purpose of higher education in Europe and working across social, cultural, intellectual challenges. Um, and um, I think that's important because the big questions of her research in the future are going to be ones which cross boundaries of, of countries and identities and, and continents. The things like climate change, things like the gen genome pro uh, project, um, things like understanding democracy, um, and, and I, I just wonder what the panel thinks about the taking the free reframing question about actually the role of universities in the future, um, and, and slightly elide from the, the Brexit argument. I mean, I am a self 
Remainer, and I think it's the right thing to do, but I do think we need to try to grab this agenda and this debate in a slightly different way. Okay. So if I take these questions and just ask the panel, whoever wants to jump in next. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy to jump in. Thank you. Both excellent questions. Um, I think the question about the Commonwealth um, was very pertinent and timely, and I hadn't realised the word didn't appear in the strategy, though it's uh, material that it doesn't. I, I think, actually, I'm sorry to do this, but your question raises a bunch of other questions in my mind. Things like, when partnerships do uh, get off the ground, how do we make sure they live beyond the tenure of an individual vice chancellor or two, because very often they're personal commitments rather than um, institutional ones, it seems to me. Um, secondly, I'm very interested in our annual lecture last year was on Africa. I'm very interested in capacity. You know, the demographics of Africa are incredible. And so the importance of partnerships with African institutions um, are, um, I think we need to talk a lot more about. Uh, and of course, I was also struck when you were asking your question, I was thinking about India, you know, I mean, it is diabolically embarrassing how that strong relationship with India has broken down and think, just look at the numbers of students coming from India to British universities, you know, the Chinese numbers have gone on growing, the Indian numbers have fallen off a cliff, they're, you know, record levels in Australia, all to do with post-study work, by the way, and we've just published a report about, on that issue. Um, so do have a look at that. Uh, um, but, but, you know, so thank you for your question, but it's got me thinking about other questions. And Fiona's question I completely um, uh, uh, agree with. Um, I think universities played the referendum very badly. I've already said that. Um, I think they were too inward looking. I think they talked about money too much. I think uh, a lot of universities got a shock on referendum day when they found they're in a part of the country you know, I was in Derby University around the time of the referendum. They told me just before the referendum they were in a very pro-Remain part of the country because all their big employers uh, are, are big exporters, Toyota and Bombardier trains, people like that. On referendum day, every single part of Derbyshire, a county I know quite well, voted leave. Every single one, including the one the university's in. So, um, you know, I think, I think it exposed something. And I think, uh, I've, I wrote 18 months ago that I thought there was quite a high chance of having a second referendum. I still think there is. Um, I think universities got the Scottish referendum wrong. I think they got the European referendum wrong. But, you know, third time lucky. Maybe we can embed some of those powerful arguments, Fiona, that you're talking about um, in there. And for me, it's about uh, partnerships. It's also about research discoveries. You know, if in the first referendum we'd talk less about the money we were getting from Europe, and more about the partnerships and the research discoveries that were going to emerge from those partnerships would have had a much more interesting story to tell that would have resonated more, I think. Is it an issue about, just to throw out, sorry, on that, is it an issue about public trust? Is there this wider sense that you raised there, that issue, um, Nick, about location and how universities and Fiona raised the question and, and so on, but that issue of trust, public trust, not just about universities and outcomes, but also about science and the responsibility of science and these wider sets of issues that does go to the heart of how, and which is a wider question than just the UK, of where universities fit within society and what they're actually doing. No, thank you. Um, uh, I think there is that big question around public trust and, and of institutions, which is, is far bigger than universities and higher education, I should say, not, not just in the UK. But if I can just go back to Arif's um, question as well. Um, uh, I'd like to link that back as well to, to my comment around the, the sort of the rhetoric around um, uh, global Britain. Um, it's very hard to persuade uh, other members of the Commonwealth and potential partners that, that we are an open country when the visa regime is, is actually just not set up in that way. So we have a rhetoric that's saying, yes, absolutely, we're outward facing, but actually the, the policy environment isn't supporting that. So absolutely, we really need to push that. And I agree with what Nick says um, to a very large extent around the international education strategy. Yes, we've been very positive. Um, that we now have this statement about uh, a statement of intent, but it, it has to be a starting point. If that's the ending point, end, then that, 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 isn't, uh, that, that isn't enough. Um, and there's a huge amount that we need to continue doing. Um, I think on the question of um, uh, the messages around uh, Europe as well, which the question 
that came uh, from, sorry, Fiona, I think, um, around things like market share and, uh, and income. Uh, yes, that has been prominent in a lot of uh, lobbying, but universities, representative bodies, and, and, and others. But I, I would also add that one of the, the key messages that we have been making as an organization, I think as a community, to the UK government is uh, very much around the, the added value of uh, the research programs, around the actual, the, the wider value of Erasmus, why you can't just judge this in sort of pounds and pence. Um, and, and I think that's, it's, it's an ongoing debate, um, but it, it, it is a message that we, you know, I think as a community, we're, we're trying to make very, very strongly with varying degrees of success. Uh, I think Horizon, we have, um, uh, we've had more of an impact on Erasmus. It has been harder to make that case because there isn't a strict financial benefit to the UK, and I think that's what a government policy is looking for, whereas actually our arguments are all about this is the message it sends, and also if you want to be seen as a, a global nation that's outward facing, then actually things like mobility and ensuring that we're, we're educating globally engaged students is a really important part of that as well. Yes, and just to go back um, to the question on the Commonwealth, um, there's this presumption that, you know, oh, the Commonwealth will replace the EU. I think that's like, in a way, like a, a big misunderstanding of what both organizations represent. And there's this feeling that, oh, in the Commonwealth we have so many friends, but I mean, that's not like true, like Mauritius just brought the UK to the International Court of Justice for illegal colon um, colonization and it won its case. I mean, these are the future like partnerships you would be seeking with you know, countries you illegally occupy. So th there's an issue there, but I think what in the research we were conducting on the Brexit project, what was interesting is that when we asked the question, you know, like how do you see your fut future partnerships um, um, you know, where are they going to go? There was, there was, it goes back, I think, to what David said about this kind of elite research networks. Um, you know, highly research intensive UK universities were really like sort of looking after themselves and thinking, well, we're going to like select partners that are also highly research intensive, highly ranked English speaking universities. And when you look at where could those universities be located in the Commonwealth, it's only four or five countries, you know, it's Canada, it's Australia, it's Singapore. Um, the, the number is really limited and that's a real great shame because it's just going to reinforce those elitist research networks and it's not gonna spread um, uh, research excellence everywhere. It's just gonna limit it to those um, small networks of top ranked English speaking um, universities that are in the top 200 of such and such ranking. I think I want to sort of come back to Nick's point. Uh, yes, the higher education sector, especially those of us, I guess most people in this room, live within the bubble of London, Oxford, Cambridge, remain bubble, and have very little contact with what goes on beyond that bubble. And it's actually ironic that we then rely on our own social studies academics to actually explore this issue of national populism. And I do commend to everybody the little pelican book that was published a few months ago by Goodwin and Eatwell on national populism that looks at Trump, Brexit, says, well, actually, you could have seen this coming over the last 5, 10, 15 years as most of us retreat into our liberal bubble and forget about the rest of the population. And the rest of the population on Brexit Day reminded us, well, not on Brexit Day, on Brexit Referendum Day, they reminded us that they exist. And the universities have not really, especially the elite ones, done much to maintain any contact with folk beyond the bubble, except that they clean your offices and empty your litter bins and so on. So there's a real issue, I think, for where universities and the higher education industry fits in. And I agree with Nick entirely. The, the higher education industry contributed to Project Scare look, if we don't remain, we'll lose our research grants and our chance to go to Barcelona and Madrid and whatever else. This is terrible. It was seen as a very narrow-minded, selfish perspective uh, by, I suspect, those that you might credit with having any thinking capacity that actually voted leave. So Goodwin and Eatwell, Pelican, yeah. National Populism. Heather Evans. Um, I'd like to ask the panel what silver linings they consider uh, they can see uh, appearing out of Brexit 
uh, obviously almost all the points you have made uh, certainly don't mention silver linings. Um, one idea might be that we shall have to, within universities, become more global. Um, think about the young, brilliant academic, now aged 23, uh, what sort of future are they likely to be considering? I have already come across a number of people who are being contacted, uh, often by German universities, invited to go over and research there. Um, there is a huge amount of research money coming, and we shan't be touching it, or hardly touching it, but it's there in the continent in many universities. Um, do you think we shall actually begin to see academics that move easily around the world and work for a number of years in different European countries, returning to the UK every so often? My name is Sadiq. Uh, I'm the lecturer of Kensington College of Business and postgraduate student at University of Oxford. My question, if you see last five, six years, the international number of international students have been reduced significantly because of the government immigration policy and which is not friendly at all for the students of uh, Africa and Asia. So, I mean, my question to panel, how you are going to evaluate the international students about their contribution to education sector in UK as well as economy? Thank you very much, Barbara Kim from Germany. So I uh, think, uh, you know, I might give a, a few comments on, on how that whole Brexit thing, you know, <laughs> kind of appears in continental Europe and, you know, apart from increasing irritation and um, even, even rage about the behavior of your government, uh, it's, it's also the, the impression is there that uh, including the universities, that the British want to keep the cake and eat it at the same time. Uh, and, and even though I agree with much of what Nick has said, uh, I think the talk is too much about money and you still want to, you want to leave the European Union but you want to still tap into the pots of money that are there. You should not be allowed to do that when you leave because you create for the other countries, uh, the UK creates immense economic losses uh, with the Brexit if, if they are going to exit in the end. Uh, so, so why should they, uh, you know, why should there be, you know, any money going, going back to that, that country? Um, uh, and and um, uh, also that, that kind of patronizing idea, you know, not sending your own students abroad and still thinking that you are creating globally engaged uh, graduates. Uh, I think that that is, is very, I, I disagree with this kind of um, attitude or, or opinion. Uh, you, you never were interested in attracting students from other EU countries because of Erasmus and they wouldn't bring in any money, but you wanted to, to uh, go to you know, um, outside Europe and attract full fee-paying students from there and you weren't even ashamed to tap into this little money that was available in developing countries instead of doing it for free, you know, offering them free education and then sending them back uh, to their countries to help that country uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, move forward and, and further develop. This is kind, you know, this is so normal for Germany to, to think that because in Germany uh, there are no tuition fees, also not for international students, not even for graduate students and for doctoral students. Everybody, you know, is educated for free and, and they are welcome and it's seen actually as if you want to, to have it in economic terms as a long-term investment. Uh, and not as, a, as an immediate, you know, full fee paying student so we can um, subsidize our research. So, so there are so many contradictions in, in all the arguments that, um, uh, that are very hard to understand for non-British people. <laughs> Barbara 
Margaret's comments, and more so from what I hear. But anyway, final comment in the back, and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, Anne Corbett, uh, LSE. Um, I thought I was going to begin this by um, warning against the aggrega aggregation of marginal optimism, but I actually see the last few questions. Uh, fortunately, it changed this back. Um, I do actually want to concentrate on um, the Europe angle, and particularly the optimistic, in fact, view that the European connections will go on regardless. Um, I actually challenge that. I challenge it particularly for repli on replicability grounds. I think, the, as uh, Ludovic pointed out, uh, the comment uh, in the international strategy uh, was, um, uh, it was there, but it, it actually didn't, didn't tackle the issue. And the fact is, it's not just the replic replicability of funding and so on, but actually the institutional organization that's required to do anything like making this Europe-wide or international. Um, but the point I want to raise a question about is that one of the mottos of Erasmus is about widening horizons and opening minds. And I, as I read the evidence of universities that have taken up Erasmus, outside the Russell Group. This is something that they have valued, whether this has come from their students going out or whether it is indeed the, the students in the classroom. Academics are obliged not to make British British jokes if they've got foreign students or European students in the classroom, and to that extent, it's widening some minds. But particularly, um, and I address my question to the Universities UK, one of the um, uh, huge benefits, and I've been in a position to appreciate this as non-funded and very marginal, um, is the scholarship that has been possible through European networks and through disciplinary groups. And I would like to know if you, UK, is in any way going to do anything to boost that. It's not part of the public debate, but it's actually something which is intrinsic to universities and has been integral, I think, to policies of recent years. Thank you. Okay, great. Then, right, so let's come back to the panel. I'm uh, yes, I will. I, I, actually, just um, uh, the previous question first, though. I, I think there is a, a sort of a danger of conflating what is um, government policy of wanting its cake and eating it and having the money but not having any of the responsibilities around uh, European membership and what I think is very strongly the, the university community uh, which absolutely wants to be a part of, of uh, the European Union. It's, it, you know, as, a, as a community has expressed that will sort of repeatedly in many ways, uh, as Nick said, possibly not the most effective ways, um, but uh, has, has made it very clear. And actually, that hasn't focused on money. That has focused on people. It's focused on the, the quality and the impact um, and, and the access to the networks that that, that participation gives us. And in fact, one of the, I think one of the clear messages that I think I've already referred to that um, uh, we have been giving uh, with and on behalf of the sector, but I know many, many others have as well, um, is just that you, you, you can replace funding. What you can't replace is that access to people and networks and just that, that kind of the circulation, which is so in integral uh, and vital to high quality research, high quality scholarship, and overall the reputation of, of UK higher education. So um, I, I would say that that is absolutely at the, the, the foreground of, uh, of, of, of our um, uh, sort of position on this. And I, I think that, that leads into the, um, uh, the following question as well, that yes, absolutely, it's, it's the, the quality and the impact of the partnerships and the relationships that a membership of the EU and the framework programs has enabled that is important. Uh, the money is, is a mechanism for doing that. So uh, yeah, it's, it, it's clearly got to be a, a real focus for the year. And if we are outside of if we're outside of the European Union, uh, and in even the worst case, if we're outside of the framework programs, um, depending on, uh, on, on how they develop and the relationship, then, then absolutely there's got to be ways there of continuing to work with and, and engage with European partners. They are, as, as I mentioned, uh, by far the most single biggest collaborator for, for UK institutions and UK researchers is the EU collectively. Uh, that will require, um, there will need to be a sort of policy environment, there will need to be funding put behind that to, to support those relationships, but they are important and they will need to, to continue into the future. And uh, just, just one final point, I think uh, uh, the, the question about uh, being optimistic about um, us uh, 
uh, people still wanting to work with the UK. I think that was a, um, uh, connected to a comment I made at the start. Uh, I think I also then followed up by saying that you know, kind words only get us so far. Um, with that, uh, yes, it's very, it's great that we have that there's so much sort of positive intent on you from European partners and from the UK to European partners. But actually, yes, we, we do need some stability and certainty and that, that kind of policy environment to enable that as well. In our view, that's a membership, that's uh, uh, sort of membership of the framework programs as full full members of those uh, full associate members. Um, yes, I think um, I'll just respond to Barbara here. Um, in terms of, I, I remember uh, well. Within our research project, we interviewed many, many people in 12 different um, universities in the UK, asking them, you know, what were their thoughts on the future uh, partnership in higher education with EU partners? And what came across a lot was, you know, you know, a thinly veiled arrogance that, you know, we're, we're the, the best universities in Europe for research. So obviously, you know, um, European partners will still want to work with us. And I think if you believe that, you, you live in cloud cuckoo land because, you know, I don't think there's any research that can't be conducted in uh, most European universities, you know, at TU Delft, University of Copenhagen, KU Leuven, Sorbonne University. Like, they can do exactly what we're doing, you know, and they don't need us to do it. Um, and I think that's something that's only in the last few months maybe, like, started to... Um, uh, be understood here, um, and that's a great shame. And I spoke to many great people who thought this, um, and that was hugely uh, um, sad. Um, Heather's point about being a 25-year-old academic, if I can imagine <laughs> being that, and being sufficiently mobile that I could go and get a career in Germany, I'd jump at it like a shot because I would end up as a German civil servant with my pension based on the German economy and the German state. Why would I take a job at UCL and end up with my pension based on the vagaries of defined contributions pension scheme? But 25-year-olds don't think about pensions, so it may not be a factor. But it might be a factor for 40 year olds, although I think you've got to get back to Germany by a certain age to guarantee that you're going to be a German civil servant when you retire. So these very important things there. Yes, I suspect we will see a leakage, uh, but that's the same stuff that other unit countries have complained about, where we've stolen their professional classes and so on. So we may just have to get used to the idea that it can work the other way against us. Um, as for the EU research funding, I mean, it's a pretty complicated equation you have to do. The UK puts in X, and the accusation would be the UK wins more than X when it gets money back for research projects. But given that EU research projects bring in overheads at the low end of the range, I'm sorry, I'm back to my being a nerdy finance person, uh, then actually it's costing you money every time you win an EU research grant. So when you factor that in, it may be that the net contribution to Horizon, whatever it is, or whenever Europe's going to be the most dynamic, innovative economy on the, in the globe, it was 2020, I think, I think it's now shifted to 2030 or 2090 or something, it's, it's always going to be moving. But actually, the, the contribution of the UK in cash terms it may not look like it's a one-way process. So it's a question mark whether we, if we, if we have a Brexit, whether we stay in that system and get money, but it costs us money to get the money. Uh, and then the final point about tuition fees, well, we had exactly that debate back in, what was it, 1979, 80. Universities said, we don't want to charge international fees, we want to have Commonwealth citizens, etc. And then they, with the 81 cuts, they suddenly realized the only way to balance the books was to fill their boots with international students paying the highest fees they could possibly get. And at the OFS board the other week, and I don't speak at any time in this entire conversation on behalf of the OFS, I'm just my mercurial self. Uh, the point is that, uh, you know, all of those strategic plans assume that if we run out of 18-year-old Brits and if we can't get the EU customers anymore because we've Brexited, then by golly, we'll actually have an even bigger market share of international students. And, you know, that's as much wishful thinking as it was in the strategic plans of the 1980s and throughout the 1990s. Thank you, and there's new figures uh, on that from the Office for Students coming out at midnight. Um, I was just thinking, if you were a 25-year-old academic in Germany, you could also afford a house, which, uh, again, in Oxford is a challenge. Um, I think it's only me between you and lunch now, so I'll try and be brief. But um, 
I mean, on the German point, we've learned a lot of happy from uh, the German attitude towards international students, and we've written a comparative study of the UK and German HE systems. Lots of similarities between Scotland and Germany, fewer between England uh, and Germany. And in fact, our most recent piece of work on international students and their contribution to the British labour market for the small proportion who stay here to work was nicked from the way they calculate these numbers in Germany. So, so very influenced by that. But, but I also want to challenge what was said uh, a little bit. It's very important that Brexit doesn't break down this idea of higher education as an international community of scholars. And of course, that idea predates the EU. It predates, actually, Europe, the modern European nation state. Um, so the challenge, because we are having this, you know, we're having this deep conversation in the UK at the moment, which is difficult and divided and painful. Um, I also think in the long run it may turn out to be quite cathartic because it help, will help us define our place in the world and the UK isn't quite certain of what its place in the world is. And if the UK's place in the world, as Brussels says, is in the long term in the EU, even if we leave, you know, their assumption is we will maybe one day rejoin. Um, I think we need to explain why, and, and I query this myself, we need to explain why all those benefits of internationalization and all the things that come from, uh, you know, you push forward the boundaries of knowledge by working in partnership across national boundaries, ignoring national boundaries, why they have to be so deeply associated with the particular political structures we have in Brussels. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but those political structures that are in Brussels are deeply unpopular, and we are so naive if we think they are popular. I mean, my parents don't live in the UK. My parents live in another EU state. They're deeply worried about Brexit. They can't get citizenship in the country they're in. Um, uh, but the bit of the EU they live in, then it's, you know, those EU structures are no more popular than they are here. You know, and if many other EU countries had the sort of vote and conversation that we had had, it's not absolutely certain the vote would go a different way. So, you know, we do have to, you know, we, this is a really important conversation we're having in the country at the moment. It's embarrassing, we look ridiculous, but it's also an important conversation about where the UK lands in the world. And the EU evolves, and, and the UK, whether it's within the EU or outside the EU, will evolve. And as I say, if the UK's future and the strength of the higher education system in the UK is to stay in the EU long term, you know, we need to tell a good story of why those political structures are right for this country and every other country in the EU. And it may be that they are, I'm not saying they're not, but by golly, has that story not been told positively? And I do want to end on a positive note, and there was a question about you know, how we convey the benefits of educating international students in the face of what has been quite a negative story from the UK government since at least the 2010 general uh, election. And I would say, I'm a, I know I've veered away from the finances, it's you know, partly about the economic contribution the students and uh, uh, former international students make. It's also about the soft power. We're the organization that does the counting each year of how many world leaders were educated in the UK. There's about 50-odd um, uh, countries in the world run by someone educated in the UK out of about 200 countries. Um, it's also about the quality of what goes on in the lecture hall in the seminar room. And if you say to students, and many of you will be educators of students, if you say to your students, including British students, do you like studying alongside people from other countries? They tell you, yes, we do. And the re main reason they do is because they think the labour market they're going to go out into is a global labour market. And exposure to different cultures and different languages and different experiences, they know will be really valuable in the future. And I, so I want, uh, you know, and, and they're right, in my view. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Nick. Um, uh, and thanks very much to our panel, and thank you all very much for a contribution. This is certainly a discussion that is going to go on and on. One thing that um, was mentioned briefly by David and certainly falls from Mike's talk, in a way, is um, the leadership and management of our universities and their role in helping to shape the future position for U Universities UK, not as an organization, but as a collective. And um, this comes down then ultimately, it seems to me, to everyone about looking at what is the role of um, universities in UK society. It is a wider debate. 
one tendency that seemed to come from the discussions will become more global, but that reneges on the issue that we also discussed about the difference between where universities are located and the communities of where they were, being these um, islands of um, remainers and seas of leave, and where that whole disparity is and the extent to which higher education is a, is a pathway for, for um, social development for those who are in it or not, equally a pathway for increasing inequality. So there are these all these inherent contradictions. But anyways, I want to thank you all very much and um, lunchtime. Thank you. <laughs>